We will sing this hymn as we change the order of service this morning. Um, certainly I trust this morning that we are indeed thankful for this privilege of coming together with those of like precious faith to uh, be a, a single steady aim and truly pray unto the Lord that anointed by the Spirit we be able to close out anything that would hinder the free course of the gospel this morning. It's interesting, we look at the course of the day and convince ourselves that we're troubled about by many things, we're busy, we have conflicts, we have things that rise up um, and occupy our thought and our minds, um, and truly that's the case. This avails us an opportunity this morning for this shortened time to close out those things, truly close them out. You can't do it by yourself. You need God's mercy and His grace to, to set those things aside because we're convinced they're important. But let us pray this morning that God would truly bless us to approach unto the throne of grace with a pure heart undefiled, with the single intention of being found worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. And if the Lord blesses and our hunger and our thirst is truly fervent in our hearts and minds, we will leave faith this morning. I trust that's why you came. So be prayerful for the service this morning. Uh, indeed, I uh, would ask you to please be prayerful for Brother Darren as he continues to recover from uh, the gallbladder surgery this week. It kind of snuck up on me. It happened before I was able to even reach out to him. But um, I'm pleased to say he's doing okay. Um, I don't have really very much more to go off of than that. So if you Think about it uh, this afternoon. Uh, reach out to, to him and let him know you're praying for him and uh, that you, you wish him well and uh, a swift and speedy recovery. Uh, pray for those that are upon your heart this morning. Pray for yourselves that the Lord would bless us to truly rise up unto his mercy and grace this morning. Ask Brother John for the word of our prayer, after which we'll sing number 493. If you'll bow, that's what we're going to do. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering together today that you have provided a place that we can come to to praise thee. Lord, that our time here would be spent in worship unto thee only. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless us as you have. Lord, that you would now take anything that would be a distraction to us and remove it from our mind. That we may pay close attention to those words that would be delivered. Lord, Trusting in thee that thou hast prepared a sermon for us today for this congregation. We pray, Lord, that you'll bless that that you've instructed Brother Jerry to study. Lord, that your grace would be upon it and upon him. And Lord, that he would be but your mouthpiece in delivering that that you would have us to hear. We pray, Lord, for those who are not with us today. Lord, whether it be a spiritual lacking or, Lord, a physical ailment, that you would just bless them, Lord, that you would give them understanding, Lord, that you would help them to realize that if they truly want joy in their life and peace in their life and contentment, they can find it before thee. But, Lord, the world offers none of those. And Lord, the things that the world would be fleeting, but thee and thee alone is that which will last forever. Lord, that you would continue to be with us. Lord, that you would bless all your churches throughout all lands, those who are seeking to be in the truth, and Lord, to know that that thou hast taught us. We pray again, Lord, for this service, this day, that you would continue in our midst as you have been so far we could feel, and Lord, that you would just bless us throughout the day, that all of our focus would be upon thee and thee alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 493, if you care to understand. Go ahead, take it on. Take it down. Children of God.
will follow thee. Certainly thankful this morning for this privilege of being in worship service with you, and I trust that we are uh, in anticipation of blessing of the Lord that we came this morning um, with a wholesome expectation to meet the Lord in this place and have a fellowship through the gospel uh, with, with the Lord by his mercy. We don't sing this hymn uh, as often as we should. Children of the Heavenly King. This is a, a song, a hymn, that uh, marks out our pilgrim, pilgrimage here in this time world. And as we sojourn in this life, it is so important that we have a focus in order that as we go forward, we're not tossed about by the things of life, but that we truly have a, a centering and a foundation from which to serve the Lord, from which to live our lives. Singing this hymn, as well as many of the other ones this, this morning, uh, I'm very thankful to uh, heard the, the song selections and the hymns that we sang, uh, ascribing glory unto the Lord, but speaking uh, truly of that foundation that we have, from which we, we serve God, and that is our expectation and our hope of living with God in glory when, when time is no more. And it's in much keeping with that that I've endeavored to study through the course of this week. My mind has been uh, centered uh, very clearly on the book of Titus this, uh, this week. And if the Lord would bless this morning, I would like to um, give a little bit of an overview and perhaps deal with, with one specific aspect of this book, um, but if the Lord would see fit, I would like to uh, truly take an exhaustive approach to uh, the book of Titus, not that I would be able to wring everything out of it that's in it, but that we would pray to the Lord that he would bless us to see uh, some of the beauty in this very short book from the Apostle Paul to this young preacher. Uh, there's, there's much to be gleaned and to be learned. So if you have your Bibles and want to read with me I'm going to go to the book of, of Titus, and uh, by way of introducing the ultimate thought that I would like for us to consider this morning, um, I'll, I'll read the, just the first few verses of the first chapter. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior." And then Paul goes on and uh, speaks specifically to Titus, and we may uh, certainly cover a little bit of that uh, this morning. Certainly, I believe that, that we will. It's important that as we consider God's Word, uh, and we look at the letters that, uh, for, in specific, uh, the, the Apostle Paul wrote to uh, churches that were in certain regions, they, and preachers that he wrote to. He wrote to Timothy, he wrote to Titus. Uh, it's important to have understanding of the historical implication and try to glean as much as we can what was going on in, uh, in that time when Paul, what motivated Paul to write these things. Uh, certainly the Apostle Paul was blessed of the Lord to have a wonderful understanding of the doctrine of grace and it, uh, it motivated him in his life and I think Paul is sharing some of that with this young preacher and to understand that Paul's perspective as he wrote to Titus and he uses the same language when he wrote to Timothy uh, when Timothy was in Ephesus uh, he referred to them as his son that uh, he was their father in the ministry that there was a relationship that Paul had with these young preachers that was one of, of great fondness, of endearment to them, of, but of great responsibility. You see, a father, and I understand in society today that 
the the definition of fatherhood, the, the definition of a father has has migrated in various ways, and it doesn't mean, I think, as much uh, on a widespread uh, basis today as, as it did biblically, and I trust this morning that it means to us today. But a father in a family is a provider, is a protector, is the one that is, uh, as it were, standing out and looking beyond the immediacy of the matter, in order to be sure that uh, his family um, is given protection and is given provision, is willing to give of himself um, uh, from a physical perspective um, in order, and, and that they would be spent in order that the family prosper and have that which is necessary for them. A father is something that, and we, you know, we, we just went through Mother's Day and the love of a mother, and, and truly, I, I think it is something that is so special uh, in Scripture. We can find example in Scripture where the love of a mother just extends and exceeds beyond um, even our ability to comprehend. I think it's probably the, the most visible love that we have interacting with a, a mother and a child uh, that resembles most closely the unfeigned love of our heavenly father. It's, it's something that, uh, and it's not to say fathers don't love their children because they do, but they manifest it differently than, than say a mother would. And aren't you thankful that God in his wisdom provided for the family in a mother and a father that which it needs. That's one of the things that concerns me so bad and so greatly in the world today is that that institution has been uh, diminished. That institution has been challenged. Uh, and uh, that there are, are people that are, are uh, questioning the very wisdom of God uh, in the construction of a family. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, it's so vital uh, in, in the lives of, of families today that they have uh, the order in which God placed in the family. And if any member of the family doesn't hold up uh, to that which, uh, which they are called upon as a member of the family, the family suffers loss. And we see it um, in families today. We also see it uh, in type in the church. You know, the church is a family. And we are interconnected one with another. And if we have one uh, a, a piece of the body, if you will, one component of the body uh, that is lacking, the whole body feels it. The whole body would, will suffer it. Um, and not only so, when you have one uh, a position in the body that is rejoicing in one uh, aspect or another, the whole body should be found rejoicing. Our carnal nature wants to say, I'm envious of that. Our carnal nature wants to say, well, I should have that, not them. That's our carnal nature. But when you're looking at it spiritually, we should rejoice with one another when we rejoice. We should cry with one another when we cry. We should be sad with one another. And we should always bear one another up. The church is a family. And it is patterned after uh, the family that God ordained uh, uh, back with Adam and Eve as he, uh, he in his wisdom, he, he saw that man, uh, it was not good for man to be alone. And he gave him an help meet. And it's, it's troubling when you see society today undermining those things. And then we wonder, why, why is there chaos? Why is there trouble? Why do families fall apart? Why, uh, why do we see young people uh, behaving like they are? It's because they're not receiving uh, the order that God put in place uh, in the family. And the father is largely responsible to set that before the family. They're charged in Scripture uh, to do that. So let us not shirk that. Well, Paul's relationship uh, with this young preacher Titus and, and Timothy uh, as well, he had that, uh, that uh, fatherly relationship with them. So one of the things that he was not willing to do was to, uh, uh, to shortcut it. He wasn't willing uh, to uh, take a shortcut or to compromise uh, the things that was important for him to teach uh, and educate these, these young men on um, as they were going out having an impact upon the church at a greater level. Paul, uh, Paul in sharing his personal experience with, uh, with Titus uh, in this, uh, this setting, in order to understand it most clearly, you've got to understand uh, what was going on. Here you have a young preacher. And Paul in the fifth verse says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Now Titus was left in Crete. 
And historically at this time, and this is important, you know, I'll tell you, I love it when Scripture uh, brings it right down to an applicable um, uh, uh, historical application so that I can look at it and I can say, wow, I can see clearly what God was doing and what Paul was doing with this young preacher and then, by God's mercy, roll it forward to 2018. You know, people will say, well, the Bible, you know, you're just old fogies. You're, you're just fanatics. You're going to church. You're, you're, you know, your life is built upon a hope and a want and a wish. And, and you're just, you're, you're void of, of being willing to deal with the, the what's present before you. I'll tell you, uh, the, when people say that, it's because they don't know what biblical hope truly is. They don't know what biblical faith truly is. And, they'll, and they make statements like, the, you know, the Bible is, is out of date. There has never been a more up-to-date writing uh, in, in, in all of the world than Holy Scripture. Uh, and, and it was written how many thousands of years ago? Multiple thousands of years ago. And it is as current today um, as it's ever been and as it ever will need to be. I tell you, if you've got problems in your life, in your job, in your marriage, in your relationships, um, in, in your own self, if you've got problems with those, uh, those uh, things that we all have problems with in life, the answers are right here. And, and God will reveal them to you as you go to Him in prayer, uh, worshiping Him, trusting Him, that He would lead you and guide you through His Word. He'll give you that what you need. Well, Paul knew this, and he's telling this young preacher, uh, Titus, you got some work to do in Crete. Now, Crete, historically at this time, was, uh, was right in the hub, the, the trade hub, if you will, of Asia and Europe and, and Africa. In other words, as trade was, uh, was growing and becoming more uh, uh, pronounced in, uh, in the world, uh, Crete, the island of Crete, was, was right in the middle of it. So it would be a, a perfect place for uh, ships to come and, uh, and, and get more goods in order that they would go on uh, to their next destination. So the, the issue with Crete and the church at Crete, they were constantly under external influence of a multicultural um, environment. Does that sound familiar to you today? You know, we live in California. You know, it, it, you go back and you visit in Mississippi and Alabama and, and even Texas to some degree. Texans are trying to become more uh, California-like, I would think, uh, because there's more diversity. There's more cultural uh, 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 activity and those kind of things. It's more of a, a metropolis, if you will, where, where people are coming together. And when people come together, uh, that can be a very positive thing. But you know what happens? They bring baggage with them. They bring things with them. That's not altogether bad. That can be good. It's good to sometimes challenge your status quo. But one thing that is very important when you are challenged in your status quo is that you've got a foundation sufficient to evaluate what's coming at you. You know, one of the problems that we find in the world today is uh, people have the attention span of a mosquito. I mean, it's like they're just moving from one thing to the next and one thing to the next. And they don't have a foundation, a bedrock uh, from which to evaluate things uh, that come at them. Well, Titus was in a circumstance um, in Crete uh, where uh, all of these things were coming in uh, to, to this society. And they were, uh, these people were coming in um, and they were bringing uh, cultural uh, differences with them. And as a result of that, uh, they, ha they had an external influence on the church in Crete. You know what was happening in that church? They were struggling with their faithfulness to hold fast to that uh, which they had been established in. Uh, they, they had all of these things. And you know, if you get enough people telling you the same thing, uh, your carnal nature is inclined to consider it. <laughs> it's just inclined to consider it. I don't know, have you ever, and I'll put this, this may be too plain, but we're going to be plain this morning. Have you ever looked on your way to church and you see uh, churches that on your way here and, and people are fighting for a parking spot and you know that when you get to, your, to Golden Gate Primitive Baptist Church, that's not going to be the problem? Has it ever crossed your mind uh, that uh, what do all these people have? Uh, why are they drawn to these things? Uh, uh, has it ever uh, crossed your mind? Well, am I missing out? Am I mi you have to be honest with yourself. 
But you ask yourself the question with the foundation uh, that is immovable, uh, that uh, will stand the heat in the kitchen, uh, that will always be the very same thing and the, in the very same place as it's always been. And then you can consider those types of, of things that come at you and, and you won't suffer loss. Tell you what, there's a lot of God's people in the world today. I heard a comment uh, recently this week. That, um, you know, I like to just bounce from uh, faith to faith because uh, they all have something good. And, and I like I like just like the variety of it. I'll tell you that wear me out that wear me completely out. I don't know how I'd go to bed at night uh, and lay my head on my pillow uh, thanking God for the blessings and the mercy of the day and pray unto Him that His providential watch care would reside over me and if I didn't wake in the morning that I'd wake in His likeness and be satisfied. If I didn't have that as bedrock uh, in my heart and in my soul, um, I believe it would, it would drive me literally crazy. Well, I'll tell you, Paul knew that all of this external influence was, uh, was beginning to weaken the faith and the stability and the faithfulness of the church in Crete. And he said, Titus, you got your work cut out for you. You're going to have to set some things in order. You know the language? Uh, set some things in order. Brother Bill worked with cement for how many years? Uh, when, when Brother Bill hears the word set, I'll tell you, it has a connotation uh, that is different uh, than probably most people. When concrete is set, all done, all through, it better be right because there's no doing it again. You've got to break it all the way down in order to repeat the matter uh, once it is set. And Paul is telling Titus, you've got a responsibility here. You've got the authority to set some things in order. And you know, one of those things, he told him, I want you to ordain elders as well. That's a great responsibility. You know, one of the problems in the church today, listen to me, one of the problems in the church today um, is that things were not set in order when a man was laid hands upon and he stands before God's people today and he's not preaching the unsearchable riches of God's grace and those things which have most surely been believed among us um, and he's bringing in new ideas and new thoughts and it's causing God's people to wonder, have I had it wrong all of this time? We don't need anything new in the church. What we need is what the church has always been established upon, of the rock of ages, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And Paul said to Titus, you've got what you need. You've got what you need, and now take it and get things set in order. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm thankful for uh, the times in my life when I truly have felt I am set, I am established, I am satisfied, I'm content, I should say, uh, with uh, the circumstance at hand and with the things that motivate me and compel me from a spiritual perspective. There are things, I'll tell you this morning, uh, that are in Scripture that I question all of the time. I go to them, think I understand them, go back to them and say, I don't think I understand that. And I keep doing that uh, in Scripture. But there are things in the Bible I'm set on. I'm set on those things. And we ought to be set on some things. Paul is, is set on one thing, and he uses that as the foundation from which to address this young preacher, Titus. Now, I want to give you a little comparison and contrast of this morning, Lord willing. Look at Timothy. Timothy uh, was at the church at Ephesus. And the church at Ephesus, uh, uh, they had a lot of external influence or a lot of external things coming at them, but it didn't bother them a bit. It didn't bother them a bit. There were, there were those, you go over to the book of Revelations, and you find at the church in Ephesus that there were those that were saying, we're apostles. We're apostles, and we've come unto you with apostolic authority, um, and we're going to help you uh, 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 correct your problems uh, in the church. You know, it didn't bother Ephesus at all. They didn't believe that they were apostles. They were established on the fact that there, there were apostles, but um, at that point in time, uh, that there were no more apostles coming in uh, to uh, the work of, of God. That didn't bother them at all. But you know what bothered Ephesus? They had false teachings from within. They had, they had uh, people rising up within the church uh, uh, ensnaring God's people. You know, there are many things that can plague a church. Internal issues, external issues. Uh, those things are uh, those things will will uh, bur uh, break down and and work hard on pulling down the faithfulness of the of the the membership and the the fiber of a church. And you know who's at the the authorship of all that? A uh, Satan himself. 
I'll tell you, when a church is prospering, uh, you, you think, well, we've got devil on the run. We'll just, uh, he's, he's, he's not going to bother us anymore. I'll tell you, that's when he focuses uh, with a, a, a fervency and he goes after uh, the faithful in Christ. I'll tell you, and when he can sow discord, that's when he's got things working. Now, here in this situation... Paul is telling uh, Titus, he says, uh, you are, you're in Crete and you've got external influence. There's always something new that's coming at the church. You ever feel that way? You know, people are, our carnal nature, people say, well, I don't like change. You know, that's just not true. That's not true. Our carnal nature likes change. We like variety. We like uh, to, to spice it up. We want things new. There are certain things that we get uh, uh, established in and we have routine and, and those types of things and, and we don't necessarily want those uh, uh, disrupted. But truly, when you get right down to it and you evaluate uh, yourself to the core, uh, you do like a, a, a little spice of life coming in. I, things a little bit new. Well, here in Crete, every day was something new coming at them. And it was infiltrating into the church and it was breaking them down. And it, it really, it, it made it hard for them to, uh, to maintain faithfulness and, and stability. And that's why Paul told him, it's for this cause I've left you in Crete, that you would set in order, set in order uh, things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. Now, this book of Titus, and I'm going to give you a quick overview, and then we're going to deal uh, this morning with, with what I believe Paul looks at as the absolute foundation for the success, listen to me, for the success of a church and members of that church. We have something this morning uh, that is the foundation. It is bedrock. Um, it is immovable. Um, it is that which is anchored in our Lord and our Savior uh, that will uh, bear the test of time. It has borne the test of time and it will always uh, bless you if you lean upon it to come out of the fray intact and in good shape. That's important. So don't let me forget to tell you about that. Here, Titus. Paul is setting in order things with Titus, and he's, he's instructing, if you look at chapter 1, he's instructing how a Christian should behave and be in the church. In the church. That's important. Paul sets this in order of importance. It's very interesting. Chapter 2 talks about the Christian behavior in the home. You know what he says? But speak those things which become sound doctrine. Now in chapter 1, he talks about preaching sound doctrine. So he's not saying you can behave in a way uh, that, you, uh, that you come up with and you create doctrine, but what you do is you behave in a way in your home uh, that the doctrine in which you believe manifests itself outwardly in your home. And there's great value there. He says uh, that the aged men be sober, Grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. I'll tell you, we need more men in the world today that fit that description. More men. And we should have every, every man uh, that, is, uh, in, that believes in, in God, that is uh, worshiping in the Spirit and in truth, uh, that is holding to the foundation of the, the things that God has ordained and set before us. Uh, this should definitely describe us. He says that the aged women... That's not talking about old ladies. That's talking about uh, no longer girls. These are, are women that have come uh, to age and have some experience uh, in their life. That the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good Things. We have men uh, that, uh, that are temperate, that are grave, that are sober, which is guided by sound reasoning, not just flying off the handle because they get aggravated about something, but they truly look around corners and try to uh, anticipate what, uh, how God would have them to deal with things, that they be guided with, uh, by sound reasoning, that they be temperate, that they have faith and charity and patience. You have a man that's behaving like that, he's going to have a positive influence on the people that come around him, and he's going to have a positive influence in his family in his family you know we look at uh at uh, young people in the world today 
And we want to point right at them and say, uh, you know what, uh, you need to get your act together. You need to behave differently. Um, and in fact, I do believe that there is a level of accountability of everybody uh, that has the ability to control their own behavior. Uh, but I will tell you, it starts in the family. It starts in the church and then it goes to the family. That things are set before our young people in order that they know how to behave. And how to conduct themselves in a godly manner. Here uh, uh, Paul tells Titus that the, the aged women likewise, just like the men, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may, be, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. What a wonderful example that that is, is before of the family, uh, that a woman that has been blessed uh, to, uh, to see that behavior and has been, uh, been taught it and has been passed down, that they in turn pass it down. That is a responsibility that we all have. It is very important that we recognize that uh, the, the gifts that God has blessed us with, He didn't give them to us in order that we would just consume them uh, to their depletion, but that we would take what God's given us and use it with one another and that it would grow and that it would benefit uh, one another. He says, to be street, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, uh, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, and people get all sidetracked with this, uh, words like obedient, because they don't understand what the Bible means uh, about it. It's not talking about a subservient attitude. It's talking about a partnership uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we understand that God has set in order things uh, where the church is concerned and set in order things where the family is concerned. And as long as we stay in keeping with the order that God has put in place you're on solid ground you're on solid ground and the results of the matter will be glorifying unto him problem is, is that uh, people say well i've got a better idea this is old this is dated this getting rid of it it's no longer pertinent in the world today uh, we got we have a better idea we've got other uh, other thoughts other ideas uh, that are coming in and it makes it hard uh, for the family to remain faithful to the word of god and, and life gets tough sometimes. But I'll tell you, the things that God has set before us, uh, even though life gets tough, He equips us to be able to deal with them and maintain our integrity unto Him and to bear up under times of trial and trouble. And not only that, if you consider families in the church uh, that are behaving this way and you're having a problem, you have confidence you can go to somebody else in the church and you're going to get good, sound advice and help. i tell you, it'd be... It, I see some, some families out there today that I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't trust them for a moment to give me any advice. I see the results of the circumstance. So in chapter 2, uh, uh, Paul, tell, and we're going to deal with this, I trust, God willing, in a more uh, in-depth way, but I want to set this before you that you get the historical application of why Paul even wrote this letter to Titus. He, in the first chapter, he says, you, here's how you got to behave as a Christian, a follower of Christ in the church. Chapter 2, how you behave as a Christian, a follower of Christ in the home. And then the third chapter, how you behave as a follower of Christ in society as a whole. And look at the order. The church, the family, society. You say, what's most important in your life? It's my family. It's my family above everything else. Well, the only thing wrong with that, that's not God's order. God's order is, seek ye first, 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 the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and the things you have need of will be added unto you. Now, that doesn't mean that the church is first and family's number five and then society's number ten. That's not the way it works. It's not even a list that's comprised that way. This is a matter of the heart. You set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. If we, if we uh, strive to be faithful in the service of the Lord and we live our lives to the glory and the honor of the Lord and we uh, recognize the blessing that we have of uh, being a member of His church uh, where He has promised to come and to commune with us and to fellowship with us and where the preaching of the gospel is, uh, which is the, the very means that God has ordained to communicate to us His children, if we avail ourselves unto that, Everything else falls in line. It falls in line. Does it mean it's perfect? 
No, it doesn't mean it's perfect. Uh, we're not promised perfection in this time world. You know what we get in this time world? We get affliction. We get trouble. We get tribulation. It's here. But aren't you thankful to know that God's given us what we need to deal with all of that? And not just survive it, but prosper through it. Prosper through it. Why do we, why do we take such joy in our hearts singing songs that, that talk about uh, going home to glory? Why do, we, why do we get such joy? Did you know when, when we're singing a song that speaks about our journey here and, and uh, the blessings of life and things like that, I love those songs because uh, they, they, they speak to my dependence upon the Lord. They speak to His provision to me. But you know when someone selects a song about heaven and immortal glory in worlds on high, my voice chimes up. My step quickens. My heart leaps a little bit. I want to talk about what a day that will be when my Savior I shall see. You know, word, when you sing words like that with understanding, it causes you uh, to, it causes your countenance to change. It causes your heart uh, to, to rejoice. There is a melody that takes place uh, in the heart of a child of God when we're singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Redemption. Redemption. I'm going home. This world's not my home. And the joy that I get in my heart uh, that bears me up enables me to deal with the stuff of life and keep it in its proper perspective. And it doesn't derail me. That's the principal thing that Paul is referring to Titus when he says, set in order. You've got a foundation. And that is none other than Jesus Christ. And, and that which the apostles were blessed uh, to build upon uh, that, that, is, we have, it's, that we're occupying today. I trust we realize today the blessings of the perpetuity of the church that we truly are striving to be identified with the church that Jesus Christ himself established upon the rock of ages himself. We don't, we don't need a man's devices we don't need the, the entertainment factor uh, that is out there to, to, uh, to draw our carnality toward it. What we need is food for our hungry soul. That's what we need. That's why we're here. If you want to have entertainment, let's go to a show. Let's go do something that is truly designed for that. But here, this is where I want my soul fed. This is, where, this is where I bring quality uh, to my life to a degree uh, that I can go forward and always maintain my integrity unto the Lord and be borne up under trial and trouble and the disappointments of life because they're guaranteed to come. And entertainment won't get you there. Chapter 3, he says, Now, how to behave in society? You, how to behave in the church is paramount. You know what? It'll move your right to behaving in your family. It'll cause you to do things that you otherwise might not do. So then how do you behave in the world out there? He says, put them in, mo put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, shewing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. But after that, the kindness of God, uh, 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 the, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according uh, to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Uh, that you understand this morning uh, that through the quickening uh, by the grace of Almighty God, you've been equipped to get along with people. To get along with people say, well, they're not the same theology that, that I am. Makes no difference. It should not matter. It has mattered down through the years. There's been litmus tests elevated. There's been, uh, who do you belong to? Where are you from? What's your lineage? Uh, what's your pedigree? Um, and then I'll decide whether or not uh, that I'm going to have anything to do with you. Uh, unfortunately, you can't find that pattern in Scripture. And by the way, that's why it doesn't work. But the new birth empowers you to overcome, rise above yourself. Rise above yourself. I tell you, one of the hardest things to do is to read 
verse 3 in this third chapter. And recognize that was me. And I have every bit the capacity to return right back to those things. Serving diverse foolishness. Being judgmental of people. Being disobedient. Uh, d- uh, serving a, a diverse lusts and pleasures. Living in malice and envy. Um, hating one another. You know, uh, it's, it's not as though when we look at verses like that, you, you, don't, uh, you don't bring it to its, its, its uh, most heinous uh, level. Uh, but understand, when you backbite uh, someone uh, that, that is a kindred in Christ, especially uh, when you're blessed to know that and you backbite them, you are hating them. According to scripture, we have that ability in and of ourselves. I'll tell you, we're equipped to rise above that. Titus, uh, Paul's telling Titus, you got to, you got to set these things in order. You got to set these things in place so that God's people quit uh, uh, reviling against themselves. You know who you violate first when you act ungodly? You violate your conscience from within. You violate first that creature that's created in Christ. And then when you do that, then it, it, it gets worse because that's uncomfortable. When, when you're blessed to know, and I will tell you this, uh, a, a child of grace does not get away with sinful behavior. Doesn't get away with it. You're, you will be called uh, before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And we will be held accountable uh, day by day in our lives of the sin that we commit in these bodies. Now, thanks be to God, there is no white throne judgment awaiting us one day. Thanks be to God, we're not going to stand before the judgment seat of God and have to give account for uh, the sins we've committed in our life. And a judge will, and he being the judge will say, uh, I'm sorry, uh, too many. You were almost there. You're out. That's not going to take place. The white throne judgment has already taken place. And we were judged in Christ. And oh, by the way, he's perfect. He's sinless. His blood has the efficacy of salvation. And we're judged in him. So triumphantly, we will live with God in glory. But you know, I get tired of whippings, don't you? I mean, I do. I get tired of the chastening rod of God. I'm thankful for it. I really trust that I'm thankful for it because it does guide and it moves. That's what a chastening rod does. A chastening rod is not designed to bring a knot upon the head. A chastening rod is designed to guide, keep you from falling into this ditch, keep you from falling into that ditch. That's the chastening rod of God. It's like a staff of a shepherd that leads and guides I'm thankful in my life for the times when uh, the shepherd had to take the crook of the the shaft and actually grab me and pull me out of the ditch. I'm thankful for those times. I've been there. You know I have. Chastening rod of God is that which leads and guides and moves and directs. And I'm thankful for, for that in my life. But you know what? It's not comfortable. It doesn't feel good. And don't we just get so tired of it? Oh, that God would bless us, that we would get so weary uh, of that, that that we would no longer uh, uh, toy with those things as God's people. Well, Paul is telling Titus, you you need to set some things in order. Now, for the remaining time this morning, I want to talk to you about the foundational item that Paul sets before Titus. And I'm going to just barely scratch the surface of it. And God willing, we'll dig into it. Listen to what Paul says. Paul, a servant of God, back chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. Paul's apostleship was contingent upon, in large part, to the manifestation of the faith of God's elect in the receiving of the things he set before them. Didn't make him apostle, but it didn't benefit those that received it unless they received it in faith. This morning... If you're hearing what what I'm saying, not just audibly, but in your heart, and it's touching your heart, and it resonates with your heart, and you say, that is me, that is me, help me out of being me in this regard, Uh, then you're receiving that that word from God in faith. You are receiving it, trusting uh, that God is revealing it unto you, that it would benefit you, and that it would help you in your life. And truthfully, 
the preaching of the gospel has no benefit to God's people unless it's mixed with faith in them that hear it. That's what Paul told the church at the Hebrew brethren in the fourth chapter. That God's people were, they received the preaching of the gospel, but it did not profit them. Why? Because it wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. He says, in the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Listen to what he says here. It's some of the most beautiful words in all of the Bible. In hope of eternal life. In hope of eternal life. Which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Does that, does that verse of Scripture make you feel the same as when you sing, what a day that'll be? If it doesn't, keep reading it until it does. In hope of eternal life, which God has promised, and who cannot lie. And He promised it before the world began. Well, you know what Paul's saying? First of all, if you look at the language, in hope of eternal life, Paul is saying, I am resting on eternal life. This morning, do we rest in eternal life? Do we truly rest? Is it a, 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 a done deal for you? Is it a satisfied, are you satisfied that by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, through the sovereign grace of Almighty God, and the atonement that came through the work of the cross of Calvary, that you will live with God in glory when time is no more? Um, is that a finished matter in your experience? And if it is, you can rest on it. And Paul says, Titus, Timothy, whoever, if you are going to set anything in order, you've got to be certain that you are resting on the very concrete, the foundation of that all from which all things flow. Heaven is your home. He's talking about the everlasting covenant. The everlasting covenant. We don't talk about the everlasting covenant uh, near as much as we should. And God willing, if, if the Lord will bless that we stay with this a little bit, uh, we're going to talk about the everlasting covenant uh, a little bit more. The everlasting covenant is, is something that we are embraced in, but had nothing to do with the construction of it or the bringing it to pass. But we are beneficiaries of it. And it speaks to the very character of God. You know, sometimes we hear salvation by grace and we sing life eternal and what a day that'll be and other songs that we sing and, 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 and sometimes we, we rejoice in them but we just take it as a matter of course. Just as a matter of course. I've heard it all my life. I can't tell you how many sermons I've heard on uh, the predestination of God's people unto the adoption of Jesus Christ by, uh, by the will of God. I can't tell you how many sermons I've heard of the, uh, the election, on the election of God, the final preservation of the saints. And, uh, and I enjoy it every time I hear it. But you know, I don't really think about it until the preacher gets up and says, well, I want to go to Romans chapter 8. Oh, what a shame. Because we have the ability to occupy a place in our lives, in our church life, in our home life, and in our society. That the only way we will do it, as God intended, is to rest in the hope of eternal life. And I don't know about you, but when I'm resting, I'm an active participant in the resting. Got home last night, I was tired. I was tired. And I enjoyed the ability to be able to just let it down and to rest. And to rest. Sometimes I wonder if, if we lose sight of the fact that there remaineth a rest for the people of God today. Salvation by the grace of God isn't a finished work. It's a done deal. The only thing yet remaining is that God take the elect family of home, uh, elect family of God home with him according to the doctrine of adoption when time is no more. That's the only thing yet to happen. And so if we can look at it, we say, finished, done. I'm satisfied, settled, move on to something else. Lord, help me live day by day. 
But understand this, you'll never move to a place of living day by day if you don't keep your eyes fixed upon the rest that you have uh, by the sovereign grace of God. That's why there's so many of God's people out there today that are laboring diligently uh, to find rest in their souls, but they're trying to do it by some activity in and of themselves, not being uh, reconciled to the sovereign grace and the finished work of Jesus Christ. And if you'll do that, now you can get up and get about the master's business. And you'll have, you'll have the ability uh, to truly be an impact in the lives of God's people around you. Uh, not just be on this roller coaster event, if you will. I mean, these are God's people that love God. And God blesses them uh, a step by step in their life. Uh, but they don't have the ability to rest. And I'll tell you what. There's nothing that feels better after a good, hard day of labor than rest. And I'm not talking about just passing out. You know, sometimes you do that too. <laughs> sometimes you do that too. That's not as much of an active participant as I like to be in the rest. I want my iced tea cold. I want my recliner up. I want to be comfortable. I want to be an active participant in the rest. You know what we're doing this morning? I trust we're resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But there's not a one of us that better be on the seat of do nothing. We should be up and about the master's business being compelled by the grace of God through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Paul says the everlasting covenant um, is that which will compel you. Now I've got to get, oh man, I've got to get one more place. Hebrews chapter 13. Look there. And there's more that we're going to talk about with this. But let's look at Hebrews chapter 13 very quickly. Listen to what Paul says in the 13th chapter of Hebrews. And we'll just start, we'll read in the 14th verse, uh, and, and then we'll go ahead and just close this morning. He says, For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We have no continuing city. Do you believe that this morning? That you really have no continuing city? You know, we, we just spent a whole bunch of money doing stuff around our house, putting concrete in, put a spa in. I mean, I'm planning to stay. Now, you come to my house, I guarantee you, I'm, you can see, I'm planning to stay. But I don't have a continuing city here. Well, why in the world would, why don't you, why don't you just live in a tent then? If you don't plan on staying. It's not a bad question to ask. But he's not talking about from a natural perspective. He's talking about from a spiritual perspective. Church, this world's not our home. It's not. And that should not bring about anxiety. That should not bring about, wait a minute, I've got grandkids, I've got great-grandkids, I've got stuff that I want to do while I yet live here in this time world. Well, good, go on about and do it to the glory and the honor of God and rejoice in every single moment of it that you are blessed to embrace it. Make the absolute best of it because when you get to glory, it's going to be better than that. But don't sink into it to the degree that you take your eye off of the rest that you have and the, whole, and the everlasting covenant and the finished work of Jesus Christ. We have no continuing city, but we seek one. Are you looking? Are you looking for home this morning? You know, we sing those songs. That's exactly what comes on my mind. I wanna, I, I, I'm looking for home. I'm looking for home. I don't know what heaven's going to be like. I know there's some things that won't be there. I'm really happy about that. I know there's a couple things that absolutely will be there and I'm really happy about that. But I don't know what it's going to look like. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Because it's an occupy, it's a place of occupation. It's a place where we uh, will live and dwell in full harmony and peace and glory before the God of all grace. I look for a city this morning. We used to sing a song when I was a boy, I will not be a stranger when I get to that city. Now there's some words in it people would pick apart and all that, let them do it, I don't care. <clears throat> it means something to me. Growing up, it made me think about it, Brother Bill. Maybe think about it, I'm going to a city, four square. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see people that love me and I've known. And I'm going to be home there. I'm going I'm to finally rest there. 
And it made it real for me as a little boy. I remember it distinctly. And I like it when we sing it from, and even today. We sang a song this morning. Where the roses never fade. My grandmother, when she died, she was not a religious lady. She was a spiritual lady. She was not a religious lady. That's what she wanted sung at her, her memorial. Where the roses never fade. Makes me makes me want to go there. It makes it real. We have a city whose builder and maker is God. I'm, I'm thankful for the city we live in. I'm thankful for this dwelling place today. I'm thankful for the lives that we're blessed to live in. But I can't wait to get there. There's something within me that can't wait to go back from whence it came. That new creature created within. All oh, that God would bless us all to tap that new creature and rest in the reality of the everlasting covenant. Paul says, and I'm just going to read this, but, but read it and study it because we're coming back here. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God when? How often? Continually. Continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Regardless, and you know what? I'm going to close with just this question. Regardless of your circumstance, regardless of what's going on in your life, right now, next week, week past, You have something, you possess something that you can, regardless of external influence, be continually thankful for. That's the everlasting covenant. That's the hope that you have within your heart of eternal life. And you know what I have found in my experience? Covetousness, greed, Self-righteousness does not, cannot coexist with a thankful heart. I can't be envious of you if I'm thankful for you. I can't be envious of what you have if I'm truly thankful for what I have. I can't be critical of you and what you're doing in your life if I'm thankful that things are as well with me as they are and I'm focused upon that. We have the ability, we have something, and, and Paul told Titus, there's a, lot of, you know, there's a lot of things, and we'll deal with some of them, Lord willing, but there's a lot of things that come and go and, and build upon this that we're talking about, but there's only one foundation. When you lay a, a foundation of a building, you don't lay multiple foundations, you lay a foundation, one, and it better be Right? It better be right. There's a big building in San Francisco. I don't know how many stories it is. It's becoming shorter. <laughs> because the foundation was not laid as it should have been laid. And it is sinking. A lot of people bought some pretty nice condominiums up there. And pretty soon they're not going to be worth a whole lot. We don't need another foundation. Paul told the church of Corinth, let no man lay no, uh, another foundation than that which is laid. Jesus Christ. And he is the chief cornerstone. He is the capstone. He's the foundation. And the everlasting covenant points to and elevates and magnifies the person of Jesus Christ. And we have something every day of our lives, every moment of every day of our lives, to be thankful for. You say, well, you just weren't with me last week. <laughs> I didn't have anything to be thankful for. I, I beg to differ. Paul says that we have the ability to be continually thankful. And in so doing, it changes how we approach things, how we look at things, how we measure things, how we judge one another. It change, And it should change how we occupy 
until he comes again. God bless you is my prayer. Trust that the Lord will bless us to remain in this vein for a little while if it's his will. And if not, you study it. It's good. And pray that the Lord give us understanding in all things. Publish an open door to the church. If it's your desire to unite with the church, come forward and let the wants know when we sing a suitable hymn. 460. 460? 460. Let's stand and sing number 460. Give one another the right hand. 460. Go ahead, John.